Fusion, the international science radio show. We have a bouncer on the doors of perception. <laughs> the good, the bad, the ugly. It gets pretty exciting. The myths, the truths. <sighs> Psychology, astro seismology, magnetism, the dark side, genetically engineered potatoes, planetoid, planetoid. I love that word. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to Diffusion. Sit back and relax while we inject weird and wonderful science directly into your genes. I'm Ian Wolfe. On this edition, we continue the conversation with Dr. Ainsley Newson about bioethics and babies with three parents and explore flavour tripping. But first up, here's the news on keeping your teeth. Fillings, a drug used to treat Alzheimer's disease, has been found by researchers at King's College London Dental Institute to stimulate stem cells in teeth into healing tooth damage from decay and injury. Currently, if your teeth are damaged, they will grow a layer of dentine to protect the soft pulp inside. Dentine is a smooth mineral that's produced by highly specialised mesenchymal stem cells called odontoblasts. Unfortunately, this layer of dentine isn't strong enough for large cavities, so dentists need to fill those cavities with silicon or calcium-based cements. Fillings don't last for life. They have to be replaced, sometimes several times. The dentist has to remove more from the tooth each time a filling is put in, and ultimately the whole tooth might have to be removed. Researchers have developed a mix of three small molecule glycogen synthase kinase inhibitors including the anti-Alzheimer's drug Tidglucib, which will stimulate teeth into producing enough dentine to repair large cavities so that fillings are needed much less often. Tidglucib is already on the market and has already been tested for safety, so this will make one less clinical trial needed before the tooth repairing therapy can come to market. The new treatment is delivered using biodegradable collagen sponges with low doses of small molecule glycogen synthase kinase inhibitors. The sponge degrades over time and your tooth replaces the sponge with dentine, leading to effective repair. Collagen sponges are commercially available and clinically approved, which should also speed the treatment's time to market. The experiments were all performed on mice who now have excellent smiles. Human trials can't be far away. The paper was titled Promotion of Natural Tooth Repair by Small Molecule GSK3 Antagonists and was published in Nature Scientific Reports. You're listening to Ian Wolfe on Diffusion Science Radio. Send emails to science at diffusionradio.com, brought to you across Australia on the Community Radio Network and podcast over the internet on www.diffusionradio.com. Dr Ainsley Newson is Associate Professor of Bioethics at Sydney Health Ethics at Sydney University. And now we continue our conversation about personal genomics before talking about mitochondrial donations. So in the personal genomics field, a rhetoric that is really strong among the marketing is this kind of idea of empowerment. And so it's it's used as a strong tone as in, you have this information to empower, empower yourself with this information. And so something I'm interested in as an academic working in bioethics is, well, what do we mean by empowerment? There's lots of different ways you could define that. It's quite probably quite strongly linked to a concept we call autonomy, which is our ability to make decisions for ourselves that are consistent with our values, that build in time to critically reflect on what it is that we're doing, and that actually sort of respect not only my sort of 
immediate intuitions now my kind of if there was a chocolate biscuit in front of me I'd be like I really want that chocolate biscuit but also there might be what we call higher order sort of desires as well in this sense that well I know that I could eat that chocolate biscuit now but it's only because I haven't had lunch yet and I'm a bit hungry and so actually I probably shouldn't do that I should wait until I've had my lunch and then if I'm still hungry I can potentially have it after that and so with this rhetoric of empowerment it's interesting to sort of unpack it and to ask well firstly what it what is it and secondly is empowerment certain to come from a personal genomics test or is it actually something that um, you can reach via other means and so I've been doing some work with another student here called Lisa and we're working on looking at kind of some of these ideas around autonomy in these kinds of tests and when the more information you start providing in a test and so as we're working up towards potentially you know more widely rolling out genome information for a greater section of the population a big question is how we actually do that in a way that the significance and complexity and meaning of the test can be understood and the way not to do that is to throw loads of information at people and expect them to deal with it that's just sort of passing the problem down the line unfortunately it's kind of the way that legally you know in our consent sort of standard in law is very much based around information but there is an emerging sort of set of debate in this area which is around um, looking at ourselves as a person in the world looking at the relationships we have with other people and thinking about what they mean and what I suppose what freedoms and constraints they provide to us but also having time to have a sensible conversation with someone about this any testing that you're thinking about having some space to critically reflect about what it might mean and, and why what you might actually do with the information and whether you think you might incorporate it in a beneficial way some other work that I'm involved with actually is around a long-standing debate over whether giving people this kind of information actually makes a difference or not. And so there are a wide range of tests available on the market to look at how you metabolise alcohol, whether you're more likely than someone else to get addicted to tobacco. But I'm involved in what we call a randomised controlled trial, which is funded by the NHMRC to look at whether providing people with risk-based information about melanoma will actually change their sun protection behaviour. And we're not not giving people specific genetic mutation information but we're giving them sort of age and geographically adjusted information including information gleaned from genetic testing and so we're saying you know based on someone else who lives where you live who is the same age as you you're two times more likely to get melanoma or not or something like that and so we're doing this with a sample of the population and we're comparing people who we give this information to and people that we don't to see if the people who receive information actually slip slop slap a little bit more than they do now so but there is this long-standing debate over whether it actually does anything or indeed whether genetics at all as a whole field of endeavour is actually living up to the hype that definitely surrounds it. And I'm sort of conflicted on that debate because I've chosen to dedicate my career to thinking about the implications of genetics and genomics and other emerging biotechnologies. But at the same time, I'm acutely aware that the technology is not yet there. You know, we simply, for a lot of it, lack population information in terms of the databases that we're using to interpret tests they are European based we don't yet have the sort of ethnic diversity that's required to give really meaningful information to the whole of the population. On the subject of relationships in medicine and ethics what are the ethical issues around mitochondrial donation? Mitochondrial donation is an emerging technology and it's called a few different names depending on where you are actually. It's one of these things where it's kind of escaped out into public discourse with a few different terminologies and it's slightly unfortunate because it ends up sort of people don't realise sometimes they're talking about the same thing. So it's called mitochondrial donation, it's called mitochondrial replacement, it's also called mainly in North America three parent IVF. And this is a technology that comes from a space of wanting to help families avoid passing on mitochondrial disease. And so mitochondria are mini organs that exist in cells outside the nucleus. They have their own genome and they are largely responsible for energy generation. And so when they go wrong, it's 
it's not great at all. And so mitochondrial disease is a spectrum of conditions. Around one child a week in Australia is born who will be at risk of developing mitochondrial disease in their lifetime. And broadly in the population, it affects about one in 200 individuals. But it is a condition that has a spectrum of presentation in that you can have very mild symptoms or you can be very severely affected and it can sometimes come up at, at different points in your life. There are also things that affect mitochondrial function that are caused by problems in the nuclear DNA. That, that is not something that the technology called mitochondrial donation can change because mitochondrial donation doesn't do anything to the nucleus. But broadly, the principle behind mitochondrial donation is to allow a couple to have a child who is genetically related to both parents, and that's one of the ethical issues. What is the value of having a genetic relationship to your children? Is it important or not, and why? But what you're effectively doing, although um, you're actually, the, the science behind it is quite complicated, but what you're effectively doing is swapping out the nucleus of either an egg cell or a very early embryo into a sort of shell that has, that has come from a donor. And so that donor's mitochondria are not affected with the mutations or the gene changes that will cause mitochondrial disease. This is something that um, women pass to their children because oocytes or egg cells have a lot of mitochondria, thousands of them, whereas sperm cells have so few because they're very small and they kind of get beaten out in the reproduction process. So it is not something that's passed from fathers to their children. So it's called matrilineal inheritance. And so mitochondrial donation, the principle behind it is to augment either an egg cell or an embryo, that is to change either an egg cell or an embryo, to effectively switch out these mitochondria that are problematic with mitochondria that are not. And when we were talking earlier, when we weren't recording, we talked about this sort of analogy with organ donation. And that's actually a concept that lots of people in bioethics have been arguing about. Because in the United Kingdom, this technology is subject to specific regulation that will allow it to go ahead, ahead with appropriate licenses being granted. So you have to be a centre that has particular expertise and at the moment in the UK there's really only one place where it is expected that this will occur and um, a licence to that centre has been granted but also each individual treatment cycle or each individual kind of patient group needs a licence too and that's not in the public domain. We don't actually know anything about that particular thing at the moment but I think it's widely expected that there will be a pregnancy you know, sometime in the next 18 months to two years. But in the United Kingdom, a large part of the debate was whether this is like a reproductive technology, like um, sort of IVF or donor gametes, donor eggs and sperm, or whether this is really just like organ donation, you're just donating a different kind of organ, you're, or donating something that's part of a cell. So that principle is kind of a big part of the debate. But there are some other really interesting ethical issues in mitochondrial donation, and it's something I've been thinking and writing quite a lot about over the past two years or so. One is, um, it is one of the first technologies that if used, or when used, it actually has been used already in Mexico, uh, I think late last year. But um, So one issue is the fact that if the person born as a result of the use of this technology is female, then she too might pass this kind of swapped out mitochondria to her children. And we call that a germline change. And it's the first example of germline gene therapy. So that has issues because generally the principle has been not to change the germline. And so in the US, where there was a report on this, they recommended, although no action has been taken as a result, that only boys be born as a result. However, in the UK, they rejected that approach because they said, well, firstly, you have to do all the mitochondrial donation procedure, which is very involved and, you know, not we don't have absolute guarantee that it's safe. And then to work out if that embryo is a male or female embryo, you need to basically break it open again and do more testing on it. So we don't think the value of avoiding germline is balanced by the risk to the embryo of having to do further testing on it. So that's two kind of, you know, developed democracies taking a divergent approach. So that's one issue. One is that we don't yet have a guarantee that this is safe. But I guess counter to that is IVF 
carries, you know, small but still higher risks than standard reproduction. So I think we can never say that any technology will be absolutely zero risk. There are issues around the fact that the individual born will have a genome that technically comes from more than two individuals because the mitochondria have their own DNA. And so the person who has donated the egg will actually have some of their genetic complement in the person who's born as well. It will be a small amount, but it will be significant because it will be the difference between the person having mitochondrial disease and not. And so some people are concerned about that. Others are also concerned about what life will be like for this person growing up. You know, you can imagine there'll be quite a lot of media interest in this person for safety reasons. We're going to want to follow them up. We, not me, I'm not doing this. Um, but, you know, people undertaking this procedure will want to follow them up over time. And how will that impact that person's life um, from a research perspective? And what if they don't want to be followed up? And how do we handle that? So... Ultimately, I think there's these issues around, you know, how important is it to be biologically related to our children and does it justify using this procedure? How do we sort of balance the sort of safety issues in the sense that we have good evidence from embryo experiments that this is safe, but we haven't yet done it in a person and and some particularly people working in evolutionary biology have other concerns that they say haven't yet been addressed. How do we balance all of that with the really significant lived experience of being a family at risk of this condition because what we do know is that this is a life limiting condition. For a lot of families you can't do anything else to avoid it apart from this because for quite complex reasons standard testing in pregnancy, prenatal diagnosis and pre-implantation diagnosis isn't always an option and so it lets them have children who are theirs as opposed to children who have a genetic complement from somebody else. And so that sort of narrative of those families is incredibly powerful and they are all very much in favour of this technology. And we have to also compare that to the effect of this on potentially more than one generation. So it's an absolutely fascinating technology. I think something else to say about it is it's very expensive, but people who advocate for this technology say, well, yes, it is expensive, but then so is caring for someone with mitochondrial disease. And it's not like there's going to be tens of thousands of people having this treatment in any given year. It is a rare condition. And not everybody who has this condition is going to want to have children at exactly the same time. But these are all considerations. Another thing we spend a lot of time thinking about in bioethics is what we call resource allocation issues. But I'll mention one more and then I'll stop, is this is a classic example also now is it's emerging of a dual use technology, which is where you might have more than one way that you can use a technology and some might be um, what we would call admirable or laudable or sort of acceptable and then we might have other uses of this technology that are more problematic. And so there is a provider based in the US who is claiming now to offer this technology as a sort of add-on to fertility treatment. So doing mitochondrial donation to boost women, particularly older women's, chances of achieving a pregnancy through standard IVF. So that is using mitochondrial donation, but not to avoid mitochondrial disease, more for fertility purposes. And so a big part of the debate in the UK has been, well, we're going to regulate this, but only to avoid mitochondrial disease. And the general consensus, I guess, apart from a few outliers in the field, is that at the moment it is unproven for any other use. And actually charging people $100,000, or US I think it is, is not regarded, generally not regarded as appropriate because we're not sure that it's safe and we're not sure that it's going to work and sort of selling it to people who have a low chance of succeeding at IVF would seem to be almost exploiting people who are probably in quite a vulnerable position. Well, it's been fascinating. Ainsley, thank you very much. You're very welcome. That was Dr Ainsley Newson, Associate Professor of Bioethics at Sydney Health Ethics at Sydney University, talking about the ethics of mitochondrial donations. And finally, flavour tripping. If you search YouTube, you can see videos of people from around the world having flavour-tripping parties and challenges, where they eat miracle berries or tablets made of the powdered dried fruit and then taste lots of different foods. Miracle berries contain a glycoprotein called miraculin, which changes your perceptions of acid or bitter flavours to sweet, without any sugar. The small tree is native to tropical West Africa. 
Although you can buy the fruits and the tablets, nobody has spent the money on clinical trials to get Miracle Fruit certified as a sweetener or food additive in the US. So it's not sold in supermarkets alongside sugar, stevia or artificial sweeteners. The miraculin molecule has a very large molecular weight, which makes it very hard to synthesize. And if you heat miraculin, it stops working. Here's how it's thought to work. Miraculin starts by being a bad fit for the sweet taste receptors on your tongue and actually blocks other molecules from activating your sweetness receptors. This makes things less sweet after you've coated your tongue with the berry. However, when you eat an acidic food, the miraculin molecule changes its shape to be a hundred million times better fit for the sweetness receptor than sugar. What happens is that as well as triggering the sweetness receptors itself, it also makes them more sensitive to molecules that you would normally find sweet, amplifying their sweetness. So when you eat something acidic like a lemon, you're tasting amplified sugars in the fruit and none of the sourness. The miraculin can stay on your tongue for anywhere from 15 minutes to 2 hours. Of course, if you've eaten large amounts of acidic food while enjoying the effects of miracle berries, you could end up with an upset stomach and a sore mouth, so it pays to be careful. Small amounts of acid foods for flavour are just fine. The Miracle Fruits Cafe in Tokyo offers dessert items that contain no more than 100 calories. All of the desserts are bland and bitter on their own, but once the miracle fruit is eaten, cakes and ice cream become as delicious as their sugary versions. There are books and websites devoted to recipes. Heat destroys miraculin, so it can't be used in tea and coffee, but if you eat it before you drink them, they will become sweet. Some companies looking to commercialise miraculin find it difficult to extract miraculin from miracle berries. So, they've engineered lettuce and tomatoes to produce miraculin. Miracle berries don't refrigerate well, but they can be preserved by freeze-drying. This is something else that's kept it from the general market. Some students in the International Genetically Engineered Machines iGEM competition have created a bio-brick synthetic biology component to engineer thalcress to make miraculin. Using the bio-brick will make it easy for other people to make things that produce miraculin. Some cancer patients seek out miracle berries to take away the bad taste left in their mouth from chemotherapy. The US Army investigated whether adding miracle berries could make army food more palatable. In 2014, American chef and entrepreneur Omero Cantul developed a heat-stable form of miraculin in order to cook with it. His new version of miraculin is only active for the short time you hold the food in your mouth. However, miraculin isn't able to be used in the USA as a sweetener due to a 1977 Food and Drug Administration ruling that the FDA hadn't been given enough information to prove the berries are safe. It will take a new application and clinical trials to get miraculin accepted for use in cooking in the USA. You can buy the Miracle Berry tablets online for about $3 per tablet, sold in boxes of 10 plus shipping. I bought a small miracle berry tree from a nursery online for the same price, which now sits in my living room window overlooking my carnivorous plants and the cold outside. The little tree should give me some miracle berries within the next year, and every year after that. When life gives you lemons, make them taste like lemonade with miracle berries. In countless ways, directly and indirectly, your product here serves the nation and its citizens, plays a vital role in helping every American to achieve a better way of life, enables or helps him to enjoy healthful recreation, have well-trained, obedient pets, make friends, have leisure time for travel, grow bigger crops, Get real smoking satisfaction. Strengthen our national defense. Keep romance from fading away. Enjoy smoother shades. Live in a more comfortable home. Take off ugly fat. Achieve success. Thus the... Your name here. Dory. A story of refusal to admit defeat. 
A story of gallant men and women who kept faith and who molded the universal dream of a better life into reality through your product here. The living symbol of our national heritage and whose contributions to the betterment of mankind will never be forgotten. And that's all from us this week on Diffusion. Would you like to hear your voice on radio? Record a voice memo on your phone or use the voicemail tab on the website. We need more people contributing stories to Diffusion. Send your contributions, opinions, helpful suggestions and donations to science at diffusionradio.com. That's science at diffusionradio.com. And please do send me an email so I know you're listening and you'd like to hear more episodes. Please like the Diffusion Science Radio page on Facebook and rate the show on iTunes. Tell your friends. Follow me on Twitter at Ian Wolf. Support the show at patreon.com slash diffusionradio. The news music was Rhinos Theme by Kevin MacLeod of Incompetech.com. Checking production was Charles Willock. I produce Diffusion, which is broadcast around Australia to 27 stations on the community radio network, including 2RBM in the Blue Mountains of New South Wales, 8 C in Alice Springs and Tennant Creek, 2NVR in Nambucca Valley, and 3NBR in the Mallee Border Districts of Victoria and South Australia. Diffusion is syndicated globally on the National Science Foundation's Science360 internet radio station and also on astronomy.fm. Subscribe to the podcast on the Diffusion website, www.diffusionradio.com. That's www.diffusionradio.com. And check the website for links, photos and videos about this week's show. If you enjoyed the show, you can explore more than 900 previous episodes archived on diffusionradio.com, where the shows are labelled by keywords so you can focus in on the stories you want to hear. Subscribe to the Diffusion YouTube channel at youtube.com slash c slash Diffusion Radio. I'm Ian Wolfe. Join us inside your audio device of choice for more science wondering next week on Diffusion Science Radio.